Welcome back. Before we get into a story quest or two, it is finally time to read a few books that we have, that we got recently. Yeah, the Byaku Yakaku collection, I'm assuming is it. There are five of them, which is how many books we collected. But they're not called what I would have expected. All right, no, yeah, this is it, for sure. All right, volume one. Mis Mysteries Creation Conceals. The sun and moon omens reveal. Ooh, bit of rhyming. And yeah, the sun and moon, that was the, the main book, so. Three corners in darkness shrouded. The void by five saints clouded. Is this whole thing going to be in rhyme? I don't think I'd mind that, but it will make parsing it a little bit more tricky, I think. The universe has no beginning and no end. And so it was with and so it was with the land that once was. But this matters not for us, for the land that bears no uh, that bears us no longer has anything to do with that eternity without start or ceasing. So said the long the lone sage Aberaku to the first sun child. Probably just a creation mythology. But uh, who knows? We don't very know very much about the beginning of this world. Of Tavon. The Sun Child had long intended to punish Aberaku. That's not very nice. What for? Summoning the sage before the throne in this manner was but an additional way of making things difficult for him before detaining him. Hmm. Was he... So he was detained after even just the first sun child. Legend has it that Aberaku was opened up to wisdom by Tokoyo Okami and was thus able to bring light to Enkanomiya, which had till then never seen the sun. But the sun child grew jealous of his talents thus imprisoning him for life. Well, incited to stand against him by those who controlled him. I assume, based off of the other things we've learned at least. Yet these children of the sun never considered that had Aberaku not created that underground star, they never would have existed in the first place. Well, they would never would have been the sun children, but they still would have existed, right? As just normal children? The origin of heaven and earth is like the chicken and egg, and are not dragons and snakes kin? No sooner had the sage Abiraku uttered these words than he was overthrown by troops, lying in ambush. Yep, and then had his soul split into five or something, it was into a bunch of pieces. Actually, I think it was like three, one per island. Four, if you include the main piece on the central island. At that time, Inkonomiya had only just been brought, been bought some room to breathe by the appearance of the sun. The dragon ears loved the dark and shunned the light, and thus could no longer act with impunity. Honestly, I'm surprised they survived at all before the sun went up. The days when the Dragonairs would rampage and graze upon humanity like so much grass had, or so, like so much grass had, at last, come to an end, where the people of Enconomia finally had the means to resist. That actually makes perfect sense. They, the Dragonairs were smart. They're not going to just eat all of the people. They're the just burn through their entire food source. Just terrible to think about, but probably accurate. Yet it came to pass that the flaws in human nature would wear their ugly heads even before such outside threats could be quelled. The people chose a sun child, crowned him king, and worshipped him. And yet he ruled with a brutal hand, framing the righteous. <laughs> Funny they would worship the sun child when well he has nothing to do with the sun's existence in this case 
unnumbered years would pass before a young child of Enconomia would make a wager with his peers. Alone, he would dive beyond the three corners. Uh, like into the pit below the islands of Enconomia? Evading the trail of the dragonairs in search of a dragonbone flower. But what he found instead within a great cavern was a mighty serpent one he had never seen before. Somehow, as he gazed upon the serpent's titanic form, the child felt no fear, but instead a kind of kinship. Hmm. Kinship. I am the profane serpent. Though my servants are numberless, not one mortal now dwells in my shadow. That I have fallen into this realm, and that we should meet... Perhaps this is fate. You are not one of my people, but you are human nonetheless. Speak your desire, and I shall hear it. Could you then, perchance, become our god? Ha! Huh. So that's how. Wait. I think I've been under the impression that Tokoyo Okami was the serpent. But perhaps not. I guess we'll see more. Um, then thus did they, human and serpent, go forth to face the royal authority of the Sun Child and the incursions of the Dragonairs beyond. Thus was the curtain raised on the turning of the tide. Now this is the profane serpent. I assume because of what we talked about or learned earlier about how the, um, well, the serpent isn't very well liked by the, uh, the heavenly principles. Volume 2 What we wish to record is the tale of how heaven's will took shape on the earth below. O oh, heavenly gods, these creations are your works. Grant us divine wisdom. Let us endlessly record. When the doves held branches. When the, do when the eternal throne of the heavens came, the world was made anew. Then the true Lord, the primordial one, came forth and did battle against the seven terrifying sovereigns, dragon lords of the old world. Huh. Seven terrifying sovereigns, hmm? Interesting number. I wonder if these are the precursors to the uh, Archons we know today. And the Eternal Throne of the Heavens, that's presumably referring to Celestia. And so the arrival of Celestia changed things. The True Lord, the Primordial One came forth and did battle against the seven terrifying sovereigns. Hmm. The true lord, the primordial one. I kind of wonder if that could be the nameless god. Guess uh, we'll see someday. Hmm. The, the primordial, primordial one created shining shades of itself. And the number of these shades was four. Oh, well. Hmm. Maybe not. Let's keep reading. On Fane, uh, Fane's? Or the primordial one? Oh, that's uh, a possible name for them. The primordial one may have been Fane's. It had wings and a crown. Paimon? And was birthed from an egg. Androgynous, androgynous in nature, but for the uh, but for the world to be created, the egg's shell had to be broken. However, Fanes, the primordial one, used the egg shell to separate the universe and the microcosm of the world. Getting back into creation mythology, aren't we? Hmm. Forty year. Uh, 
forty years after the held branches. Forty winters entombed the flames, and forty summers churned the seas. The seven sovereigns were vanquished, and the seven nations submitted to the heavens. The primordial one, the great sovereign, began the creation of heaven and earth for our sake, that of its creations which it cherished most, who would soon appear upon this earth. Hmm. I mean, okay, so there were the, um, the world of Tevat did exist somewhat in its current form, ruled over by the seven dragons, and then it would, um, eventually replace the seven sovereigns with the archons, it seems. It's possible that the primordial one just changed, you know, goes by the heavenly principles now, but that's pretty heavy speculation at this point. I wonder which creatures, though, it cherished most. Not humanity. They're the ones I think that already existed. The seven nations. Hmm. 400 years after the held branches, the mountains and rivers were made, and the seas and oceans accepted those who rebelled and those who would not kneel. Uh, that's a way of saying they were killed, I think. Unless they meant they were pushed in, you know, below the earth into where, for example, economy is now. The primordial one and one of its shades created the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the fish of the sea. Hmm. Together, they also created flowers, grass, and trees, before finally creating humans. I guess the seven nations are not the realm of humanity. Maybe humanity is the one, are the creations that they cherished, cherished most. Interesting. I wonder what the seven seven nations were before then, though. Were they nations of dragons, possibly? Um, I mean, this world seemed sounds like it was pretty barren, aside from whatever those creatures were that already inhabited the place that formed the nations, the seven nations, before finally creating humans, our ancestors, numerous as the stars in the skies, uncountable as the sand of the sh on the shore. From that time, our ancestors made a covenant with the primordial one, and so entered into a new age. Also, yeah, for our sake, so the writer of this which would be a human. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not like this is being written by some other being. The year of the Ark's opening. The primordial one had a sacred plan for humans. As long as they were happy, it too rejoiced. Hmm. The year after the Ark's opening. Oh, the, that was the year of the Ark's opening. This is the year after the Ark's opening. The people worked the land, and so came the first harvest. The people mined, and so reaped the first crop of precious ore. The people gathered, and the first poems were written. Hmm. If things go wrong at some point, they broke this covenant, perhaps, and that's why they had the uh, falling out with the nameless god. Would be my guess. Still very curious about this pre-humanity era. But I think... Well... Actually... 
It says it drove them to the oceans. It very well might be referring to the Vishaps. The dragon ears. That would make the most sense, I think. Drove them to the seas. Because they, they become the baptismal Vishaps. The ones who would not kneel. Because the seven sovereigns, I think they refer to as dragons earlier. Yeah, the dragon lords of the old world. Makes sense that they would rule over the dragon heirs. Not sure what they... I'm very curious what the world... What, if there was anything on this world besides them. And I guess the water. And the land before. The primordial one. Because it says they created the... Pretty much everything else. Yeah. Yeah. The birds, the beasts, the fish, flowers, grass, and trees. What was there before? How did the dragon, I guess the dragons perhaps didn't need sustenance? Possibly. Well, let's keep reading. If there, uh, the year of Jubilee, if there was hunger, the heavens would bring down food and rain. Nice. If there was poverty, the earth would bring forth its riches. If melancholy were to spread, the heavens would reply with their voices. The one taboo was to succumb to temptation, but the path to temptation had already been sealed. This was what, uh, was this, was temptation, the path to temptation, what the people in Enconomia discovered, or the, um, serpent rather the profane serpent maybe I remember they they discovered something that pissed off heaven the funerary year the second throne of the heavens came and war was rekindled as it was in the world's creation that day the heavens collapsed and the earth was rent asunder our ancestors and their ancestral land fell into the place, into this place during that conflict. The era of darkness had begun. Oh. Interesting. I mean. So, the sinking of Atlantis then. Presumably, though, Atlantis wasn't the only, well, Enconomia, Byaku Yakuku. Um. I don't. I don't believe they would. It would have been the only people on Tavot at that point. They were just the ones that sunk, for whatever reason. Would be my guess. The first year, and of course, now everything that's going on the surface, they have no idea about. So I can't really correlate. I don't know. So curious about the history of this world. Um, the first year of darkness. The people of the seven sovereigns had found refuge in the oceans. Yeah, that's definitely talking about the Vichaps. And the dragon heirs of the depths ruled this particular place, which led to war between them and our ancestors. Actually, going back, very curious about what the second throne of the heavens is. So I don't think Archons existed yet. Presumably that's a creation of the primordial god to help rule over humanity. Perhaps in response to conflict like this, but hmm. once again, that's just speculation right now. Don't have much evidence for it. Yeah, ruled this particular place, which led to war between them and our ancestors. Our ancestors chased them into the shadows with the light of a thousand lanterns. Yeah. And they hid in those shadows, hunting us. Uh, didn't take a while for that to be built, though. This is the first year of darkness. But there was only darkness in this place. 
and so their hunting grounds were untrammeled. The prayers of the people turned into lamentations, but the primordial one and its three sh other shining shades could not hear. I'm also curious about these other shades of the primordial one. Not the Archons, there aren't enough of them. But that's a shame though, they were removed from the gaze of the primordial, of the gods of the heavens. I wonder if uh, it was an accident that they sank, though, or if they had lost the favor of the heavens. It also doesn't specify who this war, this war was between. Presumably, between the first throne and the second throne. Maybe this primordial god is dead. Maybe the second throne won and usurped the first throne. Parable of the Sun In a dark cavern, there lived a group of people who had never seen the light. Among them was a sage who had once seen the sun. Yeah, this is when the sun is made. Abe Raku is who uh, I think they're talking about here. Which makes me uh, wonder what this light of a thousand lanterns is then. Um... Among them was a sage who had once seen the sun and told the gathered folk about what life under the sun was like and about the great might of the sun. Seeing that they did not comprehend, he lit a torch, and thus did people come to worship the flame, believing it to be the sun. They even got used to a life of darkness and fire. When the sage died, someone would monopolize the flame, using it. They would cast a long shadow over the land. Actually, maybe that wasn't Abiraku. But, I mean, this is a parable. It could just be speaking in... You know, it's a... It shouldn't be taken quite literally. Saying he lit the torch could be very well be referring to the uh, creation of the, um, the White Knight. The, um, I'm blanking on the name of the actual structure for, for the moment. But yeah, with how parables are typically written, that's probably the torch he quote-unquote lit. And then it was monopolized, yeah, referring to the, the rulers and the sun children. The parable of the lethied lotus. A lotus that causes all who look upon it to forget their troubles. A ship captain... Searching for the way back to the surface, discovered a tribe of people who ate these lotuses. Some crew members stayed in that pa in that place. Others rejected that temptation. Life is a boundless ocean of suffering. We are only searching for the way home. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand this one. And it does seem there was water under the surface at Anconomia on which they could sail at some point, which does make sense. Like I said, you saw the uh, underwater, the signs of the place having once been underwater. The third year of darkness. We knew the only one who had not forsaken us as the ruler of time. We've actually heard of them before, a long time ago, when we went to the off-map island in uh, Mondstadt. I think I speculated that it m <laughs> perhaps was Paimon, just because of how time stops when we, uh, for everyone but Paimon. And, you know, when we go into the menu and she, uh, pushes time forward in the world for us, but. Probably not. But who knows? We did fish her out of the ocean. Um, she was the moment. She was every moment. She was the measure of a thousand winds and the sun and the moon. She was every second of joy, every moment of rage, every instant of longing, every minute of obsession. 
She was every flash of delirium. We call her Kairos, the, or the ruler of the unchanging world. We dare not speak her true secret name. And so I pen it here, but only once and in reverse. Patorazzi. Istoroth. Is 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 hmm. Her true name is Istoroth. Why do you not dare, um, speak it, I wonder? I mean, if it was actually Paimon, it would almost certainly be a case where she was, like, sealed away at some point and, uh, like, uh, lost her memories or something, but once again, that is heavy on the speculation and mostly a joke, but there's there something up with her. Um, the year of blindness. The sage Abrax's wisdom was awakened. Another name we've heard before. And he unveiled a light bringing a miracle within uh from within his hands so our ancestor began ancestors began to build the helios with him as their leader i want is this parable this parable could still be about that they didn't give us a name there yeah but that's hard to say however this is certainly when Things were, um, yeah, the actual history. There's a lot of mythology and history mixed in here. It makes it hard to parse what is what. And, huh. So, Abrax actually ruled for a time. I don't think he mentioned that to us. Unless... Well, wait, was Abiraku's actual name Abrax at all? I think so. I think Abiraku was what, a name that came after. Or it might have actually just been the uh, Inazuman name for him. Sounds very Inazuman. Um, the year of sight, or the first year of sun and moon. Helios. The divine chariot of the sun was finally completed. The white knight came, and ever night was banished. The years of the sun and moon had begun. The second year of, the, of sun and moon. Our ancestors sought the returning way, for surely the war of the, on the surface had ended by then. Probably. But the primordial one, the first throne. Yep. So the primordial one was the first throne, had laid down a ban, preventing our ancestors from finding the path home. Why? Huh. In that case, the primordial one must have defeated the second who came. Apparently so. Abrax was imprisoned by order of the sun child. Right, so that's when they turned on him. So he ruled for a year. About. And it actually, it says he was their leader, but it sounds like that's more of a, uh, you know, we listen to him. He is a honored person, but the actual leader was the sun child still. Or perhaps this is when they created the sun child, you know, the snakes created the sun child to uh, overthrow Abrax through their jealousy. The parable of the tree. Still very curious as why the um maybe the uh, people of Enconomia sided with the second who came. I suppose that's possible. 
that would explain why the uh, the primordial one, you know, banned their uh, ancestors from finding the path home. Though they eventually do find a path home. The Parable of the Tree The king's gardener and the tree spirit of the royal garden were in love, but the king wished to repair the beams of beams of his pavilion and so he and so needed to cut down the tree with the most spiritual energy within it oh no poor gardener um the king was the incarnation of the primordial one and the gardener could not defy the sovereign of sovereigns and so he could only bring his plea to the king's priest was the incarnation of Tokoyo Okami. Hmm. The priest had pity on the gardener and said to him, Go and cut the branches of the spirit tree down. The gardener did so, and afterward did as the king ordered, cutting the spirit tree itself down. Huh. Wonder what changed. Then the priest said, plant the spirit tree's branches in the ground. Oh, but the gardener said, a spirit tree shall take 500 years to grow. The priest said, your one thought shall echo through eternity. And so the gardener planted the branches in his backyard. In an instant, the slim branches grow, grow into a new tree. And the new tree spirit was a continuation of the past one. Is that about the, uh, the tree on Narukami Island? I mean, that tree had some time shenanigans, too. Interesting. For it is the god of moments who is able to take seeds from this moment into the past and the future. Right. That, that feels like it's gotta be about the, um... The sacred blah, the sacred, uh, the sacred Sakura. Though not sure how they would know about it. The tenth year of sun, though they eventually do come into contact with Narukami, and the uh, the upper world. Not sure when that happens. The tenth year of sun and moon. Abrax is long gone. The events before the sun and moon have been recorded sufficiently. Well, if I did not dare write to write things down just as they happened, how could I consider myself a scribe of Tokoyo Okami? Hark, I hear armor without. Here I shall stop writing. Um, was whoever wrote this down going to be arrested too? Hmm. That was... Very interesting volume. A lot of open questions still. A lot of things to put in place. But very interesting. Are we we're about halfway through the whole thing? Damn. All right. This might be the whole episode. Volume three. The lands beneath the aphotic depths are vastly different from those on the surface. To the extent that all surface derived common sense must be abandoned down below. Understandable. All we formerly knew of land and sea was given in unto us directly by the heavens. In this new world of ours, we must begin groping even for the simplest methodologies anew. O oh, you who come after the re after and read these words, do not take the life you lead for normalcy. Even if after a hundred or thousand years, people should grow used to life down here, always remember, these days with neither sun nor moon were abnormal. Yeah, it honestly sounds horrible. Like terrifying and, you know, you're in a perpetual darkness, surrounded by the dragon heirs who just wreak havoc on you forbidden from returning to the surface actually that I think that came after the white knight I did just read that 
I guess I could go back and check, but... Even if some sage were to draw us the sun, there will surely be filthy wretches who will borrow its light to cast long shadows over us. That is what happened. This book is intended to help people understand the world they live in, to never forget our desire to return to the light. The book has been constantly edited, redacted, and modified over the years. Even the name of the book's title has been changed from Aphotic Earth to to uh to Koyo to Koyo Koku before becoming Byaku Yakoku. Huh. Interesting. So that's where Byaku Yakoku came or it wasn't always called Byaku Yakoku. Which once again makes sense that that's the um Narukami name for them, I think. Later Due to the grace of Watatsumi, the people of the depths of the depths could return to the sea's surface. But it seems like Aphotic Earth was, had some special meaning, and has not been universally changed throughout the text. Now, here is one of the prevailing questions on my mind that may have been answered, or I might not have just parsed properly, but Takoyo Okami is the serpent who i assume is also the same being as watatsu you know i i think it was watatsumi okami just you know perhaps a name change but then i also assumed that was the god that the shogun slayed and is currently on the island just next to watatsumi island but I became less sure of that at some point recently. That might have been a separate god. Hmm. I'm not sure if that's been made... So assumed to have been made clear at this point. I'm just mixing things up in my mind. Or maybe it'll be answered later on in this. Of wind and water... Yaku Yakoku has no mountains to speak of, and so it is pointless to speak of them. <laughs> Fair. However, our priests and sages have detected something. Actually, that's not... I mean... Well... You have peaks, but no mountains. Okay, fair enough. Um... However, our priests and sages have detected something. Even in these depths power of the undying wind and the water still remain. The personification of the undying wind is known as Tokoyo Okami. Oh. Huh. And is poetically rendered Thousand Winds, or the Thousand Winds of Time. Water, on the other hand, is the might of the Vishap realm, represented by the Vathismal Vishaps. We have already developed a certain study, a certain field of study regarding the relationship between sun, fire, wind, and water. Sunfire, is that just the word for actual fire? Since they sort of miss, in the other parable, mistook the, um, the torch for the sun. As such, both hydrology and the undying wind must be considered before undertaking any project of civil engineering. I mean, you live in a underground ocean realm, yeah. The borders of Byaku Yakuku. The borders of Byaku Yakuku are marked out by three corners. These mark the limits of the seesaw clash between humanity and the Vishaps. During the era of Byaku Yakuku, towers of the three realms were built at these three corners used to harmonize the three realms. Oh yeah, uh, we visited all three of those. So those mark the boundary then. Their ancient names have been lost to time and they were renamed after the coming of Watatsumi. The coming of, so Watatsumi sounds like a different God than Tokoyo Okami. I think Okami might just be a name like a title given to gods. I mean, Kami makes me think that. I'm not sure what the O 
the front of it, how that modifies it, but... These towers are exceedingly important, and they are not in locations aligned with other wind or water. Rather, their purpose is to stabilize the tendencies of Byakuyakoku and control its winds and waters. Maybe that's why the place is currently drained. Also, there wasn't really any wind. These towers were to be imperiled, so would the entire nation. As such, they have been hidden using secret arts. Only the shrine maidens and the vassals of Watatsumi can summon them forth. So actually... Wata mm, I think Watatsumi, because there was a Watatsumi Okami, I'm pretty sure. The Narrows. The Narrows were, in the earliest times, sandwiched between the mountain face and an, un an, and an area known as the Roundlands thus earning the, no the location its name. However, the exceedingly strange tectonic shifts in Byakuyakoku caused the Roundlands to collapse into the depths, thus causing the Narrows to widen significantly. Huh. Well. I guess that explains the, um... gaps between the islands, then. I sort of assumed it was just filled with water at some point, but... Huh. The Serpent's Heart. From the first time our ancestors discovered this place, I wonder if... Well, no, it's the fact that it's recorded here tells me it must have happened before they left to the surface. The Serpent's Heart. From the first time our ancestors discovered this place, it had already play played host to a unique phenomenon in which space itself might overlap in a certain locale. Later, those who came before us would utilize this phenomenon by creating the Serpent's Heart. It would be used to guard secrets, imprison criminals, and worship the great imaginary serpent Ouroboros. Uh, huh. Interesting. Oh wait, Watatsumi had the Omikami attached to it, its name. Not Okami. Still, though, the fact that it has the Kami attached tells me it must be a god. I wonder if this imaginary serpent Ouroboros is actually the Tokoyo Okami, which I think they said earlier was, in fact, the serpent, the profane serpent. Somewhere. Yeah. Could you then perchance become our god? But maybe uh, Tokoyo Okami was lost to time or something happened. Well, regardless, um, and worship the great imaginary serpent Ouroboros. In the earliest times, this place was called Delphi, the land of snakes. The name did not change even after the arrival of Watatsumi Omikami. Ancient art depicts the scaleless serpent as Ouroboros, and the coral-adorned serpent as Orobashi. Hmm. So there were two serpents, then. The more answers we get, the more confused I get. And the more answers, the more questions that are raised. Dai Nichi Mikoshi. That was the name of the Helios structure. The, early, the earliest name of this place was Helios, and it was the high tower built by the sage Abiraku, standing for Earth, the element between wind and water. According to prophecy, this was likely the sun that the sage displayed, used to light those lightless ca caverns. And just as those prophecies suggested, it was also later used to cast a great shadow over the nation. Yeah? Hmm. Fascinating. Volume 4. Effective today, all experiments regard... Oh, hey, it's this one. Effective today, all experiments regarding the Dragon Ears will be directed by Watatsumi Omikami in person. Okay, maybe Watatsumi is actually straight up just a person then. Though... 
the gods can take the gods we know do take human forms, so it doesn't rule ever anything out, I guess. All fi uh, all files preceding the founding year of the Watatsumi calendar have been destroyed. Damn. Dossier serial numbers shall no longer use the categories Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon, which used the ancient Watatsumi tongue. Hmm. So they, um... This is uh, the arrival of Watatsumi Omikami. It was actually when the switch was made from sort of more Greek-style words and names to uh, the Narukami style. So presumably this Watatsumi Omikami was from the surface and from Inazuma. Um... Instead, we shall use earth, water, fire, wind, ether, and void going forward. That's not enough characters. All quotes and notations are to be written within quotation marks. The following order of writing shall be observed. File header, serial number, subject, author. Also, making them uh, rewrite every... Uh, well, I guess they've probably learned this new language, this new written language already, so perhaps it's not that big of a deal. Author can be omitted, or their internal title within the research lab may be used. Yeah. Usage of a researcher's ancient Byaku Yakoku Enkanomiya name or modern Watatsumi Narukami Inazuma name is forbidden. You know, Enkanomiya and Byaku Yakuku, even those are still, I think, the uh, Watatsumi uh, Narukami slash Inazuman name for their ancient society. I don't know if we've actually heard what they called themselves before the name change. At least I don't recall hearing any Greek-sounding name for their society as a whole. But right, you can't use their name regardless of whether it's their ancient or their modern name. These experimental records are not to be used for the writing of diaries, love letters, or fantasy novels. Of course not. And so actually... Yeah, th this makes sense that the people, the, the transitory, that that middle generation of people who um, were there before Watatsumi Omikami and after would have two separate names. The Dragon Heirs, hereafter named Bathysmal Vishaps or simply Vishap, Vishaps, evolution is plain for all to see. Water 101, Dragon Air Evolution 1. We have tried lowering the temperature in the living environs of a young, heat-resistant Vishap. As a result, they were weaker once matured. Oh. We suspect that this is because its body did not possess the seed required to resist such an environment. However, its descendants would all possess high body fat, greater predilection towards sleep, and would express the cryo element. Please refer to the experimental data after the main text. The abnormal data derived from sample 3 is due to my assistant feeling sorry for the subject of the anti-hunger control group and feeding it surreptitiously. Oh. Uh. Whoops. When we play, then, then place their descendants into sweltering conditions, they would again choose, like their ancestors, the heat resistance trait. However, None of them have developed traits indicative of the pyro element thus far. Hmm. Maybe that's why we haven't seen pyro vishaps. We do not have enough data to reach a conclusion at present, but we have we, we can make an educated guess that bathysmal vishaps have the ability to awaken their seed freely before maturation. Vishap mothers also can uh, can also create new seeds to pass on to their descendants should they encounter heretofore unseen, challenging environments. It can be said that even before encountering us, 
the people of Enconomia, the Pathismal Bishops, had already stored a veritable armory within their bodies. Hmm. It is interesting that they refer to the Vishamps as people. That they see them in, in that way. Rather than as monsters. The results of the intelligence tests are astonishing. Void 207, Vishap Intelligence Research. Through a screening process consisting of rewards and punishments, although previous research indicates that screening is unnecessary, Vishaps are, one and all, adapters par excellence. The linguistic capacities of Vishaps four generations down are starting to approach that of a 12-year-old human student. Damn. I don't think I've ever managed to communicate with one, but it sounds like we theoretically could. Perhaps it might be more accurate to say that bishops are always had their own methods of communication, and that they are what they are displaying here is their ability to learn. Probably. We believe that these experiments should be stopped. If not, we may yet to be pro we may we eh. If not, we may yet be proven narrow-minded for having dismissed that last person who wrote a fantastical tale about Vishap people. Well, you referred to them as people before here, right here. The people of Enconomia, the Bathysmal Vishaps. Sounds like perhaps... Hmm. Maybe you're losing, you're using the word people very loosely. Just referring to them as the dominant population. Instead of as sentient beings. Or sentient intelligent beings, rather. Um, where are we? Yeah. Uh, experiments for, uh, prophecy holds that the dragon sovereign of water will be born in a human form. We must not let this thing happen in 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 Enconomia. The Dragon Sovereign of Water. Huh. Have we seen a Dragon Sovereign of Water? I don't think we have. That's the kind of thing I was expecting to find down here. But we never actually did. Maybe that's the god that was slayed by uh, the Shogun. All previous attempts at grafting have failed. Void 907, Watatsumi Omikami's Special Orders 1, because they cannot accept Watatsumi Omikami's blood. Maybe the Omikami is a god. The Vishaps will fall victim to various adverse effects. Perhaps they are not yet strong enough, but we cannot be sure. Indeed, according to our rationalized Vishap evolutionary roadmap, we should have already bred the strongest Vishap possible. You know, it really is interesting you were trying to breed strong Vishaps, considering your history with them. The grafting can be considered a success. Void 907 Watatsumi Omikami Special Orders 3 Rejection originates from the Vishaps having been beings of the Light Realm, also known as elemental creatures, and thus beings at odds with the human realm, of which Omikami and its coral vassals are a part. Right. As well as you guys. Or are you or their coral, coral vassals? Maybe the humans are coral vassals. Probably not, though. All experimental... And, hmm. So... Elemental beings. They are elemental beings. I'm just thinking back to the very first volume. And, um... I, I kind of... I'm thinking that the... Beings alike... Really, all elemental beings then would have been, would predate the primordial god, I think. 
Not necessarily every primordial being, I imagine. New ones could have been born after the primordial, the primordial one came to be, or came to this place, but... They are separate. Probably inherent. I don't think the primordial one could probably... I, I doubt they could remove them entirely or prevent them from being born. Um, all experimental logs are closed. No experiment conducted here resulted in the death of any dragon heirs. They all live to see the end of their days. Praise be to Watatsumi Omikami, gracious and beneficent. I'm... a little doubtful of that, but... Volume 5, the last volume. Question 1. What walks on four feet in the early morning, two feet during the day, and three feet at night? Uh, are you talking about that's the old riddle of a human? Answer. A vishap who transforms into a person to attend a ball, then breaks one of its legs and eventually ends up walking with a cane. <laughs> that's a, um... That is a, uh, a new answer for that riddle. Sages like this answer the most, and it is the children get it, and, and it is the children get it right almost exclusively. For adults, it always smells like a horrible conspiracy when a bishop turns into a human. According to a prophecy of old, the dragon of water, the ancient lord of bishops, will definitely descend in the form of human, in the form of a human. However, for children, the answer to the question indicates the possibility of mutual understanding. But it is not a good idea to make Vishap sound adorable. I mean, it did sound pretty cute. Though jokes, though such jokes defang the, de defang the fear, they also lower the guard of the children. And the Vishaps are still dangerous beasts. Dragoneers of the Depths have evolved to wield the power of other elements and have hence lost their purity. As such, the Dragon of Water will no longer be born among their ranks. Oh. What if this Watatsumi Omikami that, that mysteriously descended in the form of a human was the Dragon of Water? Question 2. With only one mouth, this being sometimes has four feet, sometimes two feet, and sometimes three feet. Though unable to morph into other beings, it is able to walk on the earth, swim in the water, and fly in the sky. The more feet it walks on, the feebler it grows. What is this being? It's not a fish epic again, is it? In fact, it's gonna be... Yeah. A human. It's the opposite. Humans crawl on hands and feet as babies, walk on two legs as adults, and use a cane as elders. The answer is undoubtedly a human. Damn it. But we... Uh, throwing us for a loop. Such a classic riddle, too. Easy to trick a person. Question three. What talks with only one mouth but walks on four feet? Or, uh, but walks on four and two feet? Answer. Someone raising livestock. <laughs> okay, these ones are getting a little ridiculous now. The ri this riddle is very ancient. Is a very ancient one. In the past, we could only understand the meaning of livestock from reading texts. Four legs refers to the four to four-legged animals like the ox, horse. Uh, interesting alternative spellings. Perhaps because they write them down just from uh, having heard them. From the ox, horse, and forest boar. After Byaku Yakuku fell into the ocean depths, these animals died out within two generations due to a lack of habitable land and food. Yeah. Since the arrival of Watatsumi Omikami, some of us have returned to the sea's surface to build a home and interact with the people there. But wasn't there a ban? How did you overcome that? Maybe Watatsumi Omikami was sent to bring them to the surface? Maybe the primordial one changed their mind? Or perhaps they died in another war. 
Um, therefore, we have been able to review the names of these animals. According to the vassal and the Omukami's uh, prophecy, we shall all move back to the sea's surface someday. So it is important to get these names right. Ox means cattle, horse means horse, and forest boar means forest boar. Yes, yes they do. Question four. Who are the two sisters who give birth to each and every other day? Wait, no. I misread that. Who are the two sisters who give birth to each other every day? Answer. Day and night. Or white night and ever night. This riddle is easy to understand. It alludes to the succession of day and night, which in Byaku Yakuku means the cyclical white night and ever night under the control of the Dainichi Mikoshi. It was interesting they chose to give themselves a night, even though I think that means the bishops could, you know, they, they could encroach during the ever night. Um, though the land was an everlasting night before the Dainichi Mikoshi was built, the light of day that people had seen has, has remained unchanged. By the way, the two spectral, uh, this, the two special astronomical phenomena of Byakuyakuku, the mirages and, sin, and the sin shades, were at first indiscriminately referred to as eidolons. Oh, hey. And seen as the two sides of the same coin. It was not until the arrival of Watatsumi Omikami that the people of Byakuyakuku were able to understand the two phenomena and name them differently. Well, hold on, though. What mirages? We've seen the sin shades. Have we seen any mirages? Maybe some of them were, um... Hmm. I mean, maybe one of the ones we talked to was, uh... A mirage and not a sin shade, and we just didn't realize it. Because they said they thought they were the same thing. Hmm. Also, it is interesting that they just sort of had ghosts walking around, effectively. Though they are constantly reliving the same day, are they not? Hmm. Uh, though the sun did not shine upon Byakuyakuku, the mirages that appeared in White Nights were named Sunfire Phantasms and those of the Evernight Ghostfire Phantasms. Oh, so there's technically some that should appear at the White Knight. I, yeah, I don't think we ran into any. As time went by, both of them came to be referred to as Sunfire Phantasms, for they are essentially the same thing. Question 5. I am the Shadowborn of the Lord of Night, or the Lord of Light. I am a wingless bird that rises from the earth to the sky. Those who shed tears in my presence feel no, sor no sorrow in their, in their bosoms. Away with the gentle breeze I fade, and thus ends my fleeting life. Answer. The answer is smoke. Birds are winged creatures, and it is normal, it is normal that they are not seen in Ankonomiya. That one actually makes sense. Shadowborn of the Lord of Light, fire. I'm a wingless bird that rises from the earth to the sky. Smoke rises. Those who shed tears in my presence feel no sorrow in their bosoms. Yeah, smoke can make you cry. Away with a gentle breeze I fade, and thus ends my fleeting life. Yeah. A very, uh, and actually a uh, good answer to one of these riddles. Question six. A father has 12 children, each of them giving birth to 60 daughters of different appearances. Okay. Wait. Each child gives birth to 60 daughters, or as a total, they give birth to 60 daughters. Of them. Also, really? 60 daughters? Uh, 
no suns at all? Or because if so, that is statistically amazing. Of them, 30 are pale and 30 are dark. The whole family, not knowing death or knowing not death, will only fade away. Who is the father? Answer. The answer is the year. Oh, <laughs> I get it. The year gives birth to 12 months and then each giving birth to 60 daughters. Actually, that's not accurate, though. 60 days in a, in a month. I guess the uh, cycle, the yearly cycle could actually be completely different here, but. Oh, wait, no, no. 30 of them pale, 30 dark. So 60. They're, they're separating days into two. I see. That, that, that makes more sense. That's a good, that's a good riddle. The answer is the year. Byaku, uh, the people of Byaku Yakuku may find the part about 60 pale or dark granddaughters a bit confusing, but everything will make will start to make sense once they crack question four. There, are, you, there used to be a sequel to this riddle in ancient times. It roughly said that every granddaughter would give birth to 12 descendants, and each of them would then have 60 children. Yes, I get it. Every such child would give birth to another 60, who would go on to have children of their own. This would continue until, at last, all the offspring would together give birth to the one and only primordial child, to Koyo Okami, the mother of 14 billion years. <laughs> That's cool. Watatsumi Omikami forbade people from spreading this riddle. So Tokoyo Okami is the god of time, then, is there, are they not? Perhaps? Or are they a people of Watatsu uh, and Konomiya associated them with the god of time? Or with the goddess of time, rather? I don't know if they ever directly named Tokoyo Okami as the god of uh, goddess of time. They did mention that they are a serpent. There it is. Or here's one of them. We knew only the one who had... Uh, we knew the only one who had not forsaken us as the ruler of time. She was the moment. Yeah. But they didn't refer to them as the... Tokoyo... Okami... They refer to her as Kairos. Are they separate beings then? Possible they became known as Tokuyo Okami, but. Huh. Tokuyo Okami actually means eternal wolf. That's very curious. They refer to them as a serpent, though. Well, actually, the uh, the Golden Wolf, Wolf Lord, is a serpent-like wolf. Hmm. Very, very curious. And of course, Watatsumi means something to the effect of uh, Lord of the Sea, I think. Which actually makes me think maybe they are the, uh, the, the, the descended, uh, uh, dragon of the ocean or whatever the specific word they used was. Like I said, the more, the more we get, the more questions I just have. Respect to the people who catalog all of this and, uh, try to make sense of it all. But yeah, they refer to Tokoyo Okami, the mother of 14 billion years. I'm thinking that perhaps Kairos, it was the name they used for Tokoyo Okami before. Because Tokoyo, Tokoyo Okami is absolutely more of a uh, Inazuma name. So it would have been what they called them after Watatsumi Omikami came. 
appendix, historical figures, their traditional names, and Narukami style renderings. Oh yeah, yeah, Kairos, Tokoyo Okami, Eris, Alisu, Abrax, Abiraku, yep, uh, Karan, Ka... something, Spartacus, Supata, Emma, Emma, something to Koi, uh, Antigon, Ant uh, Antigonus, Antigonus, Anti, uh, Antai, Erebos, Eboshi, Echion, Eki, uh, Udeus, Uda, uh, Asclepius, Surep, uh, Surepio. Interesting. Well, that does answer that question. Tokoyo Okami is the god of time. It was made kind of clear here. Um, fascinating. And was sealed away. I didn't actually find that that line again. You know, the primordial one, now that I think about it, the primordial one probably instituted that ban because they became followers of the um the, the ruler of time who had been cast down by them. Well, that was all very, very interesting. Yeah, if, if Tokoyo Omikami is, in fact, the ruler of time, I am less... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Paimon, I'm pretty sure you're not you're nothing special. But, uh, yeah, I think that basically... I think that's all we're doing for today. But next time, for realsies, we will uh, do a story quest. And then... Actually, which one will we do? Two I'm most interested in doing at the moment are Shao and Jean. Um, we'll do Shao and then maybe Jean, depending on how long Shao's takes. We have a lot more to do, and we'll only keep growing the number that we have to do as we uh, progress through the story. Well then. Until next time.